today we're going to be moving on and talking about seagrass beds. Um, we're going to be talking about what it is, some different kinds, why it's important, and what's happening to them. Again, for those that don't know, my name is Dora, and I am the Education Manager for Reef Relief. Are seagrass and seaweed the same? Yes or no? Are seagrass and seaweed the same? All right, guys, so it looks like most of you got it right. So seagrass and seaweed are actually not the same. They're very, very different. So go ahead and get out worksheet one. And I'm going to be telling you guys a few different things about seagrass and seaweed. And it is up to you guys to fill out this worksheet. So here we have seagrass, here we have seaweed, and in the middle is both. So if there's something on here that kind of goes with both of them, then you'd put it in the middle. If there's something here that only relates to seagrass, then you put it over here. And if it only relates to seaweed, you put it over here. So again, guys, while I'm doing this and while I'm talking, you guys can start to fill this out. Um, I'll be saying all of these items here for you guys. If you don't have the worksheet, that's totally fine. You can just write on a separate piece of paper or just think about it. And um, so guys, to start off with seagrass, it is a plant and it is not the same as seaweed or algae. So think about grass that you have in your yard, but think of it underwater. And that's exactly what seagrass is, is what it sounds like. Um, seagrass and seaweed are very, very different. So there are between 50 to 70 different species of seagrass. So we'll say about 60 species of seagrass, but there's actually between five to 6,000 species of seaweed. So there's a lot more seaweed than there is seagrass. So the way seagrass reproduces is by flowers and seeds. So seagrass, even though it's underwater, it still has flowers. Seaweed does not have flowers. So seaweed reproduces using what we call spores. So they have spores instead of flowers. Your seagrass has roots, leaves, and stems. So like a lot of plants that we know about. Um, but your seaweed does not. Your seaweed does not have roots. They have what we call holdfasts. So that kind of sticks them onto a rock or something solid, but they do not have roots, they don't have leaves, they don't really have stems. So seaweed doesn't have all that plant-like stuff. Seagrass has roots, leaves, stems. They also have rhizomes. Um, they both do take nutrients from the water. So they actually do collect a lot of nutrients um, in that regard. They also both can photosynthesize. So. We've talked about this several times. Photosynthesis is getting energy from the sun. So they both can do that. And they both can live in salt water. The other major difference is that again, seagrass is a plant, but seaweed is what we call a protist. So that's a completely different kingdom of life. Um, so again, seaweed is a protist, seagrass is a plant. So they are not related at all. So guys, seagrass is very, very important. They say that Florida, the state of Florida, has about 2 million acres of seagrass here. And seagrass is important because it provides a habitat or a home. It's also a nursery. So a nursery is where baby animals especially will live and take cover. So they'll hide in the little blades of seagrass to protect themselves from bigger predators. So seagrass is very important nursery. It's also a food source, which we'll talk about. They also hold down the sand and the sea bottom. So the seagrass that grows in the sand prevents all the sand from just being able to wash back and forth in a wave. So it holds all that sand down and seagrass helps clean the water. So the seagrass is responsible for making sure we have nice, clean, clear water for our other ecosystems. So let's talk about rhizomes. So you guys probably don't know what a rhizome is, so I'm going to let you guys guess first on this poll at the bottom. What are rhizomes? Is it a set of roots that connect the grass together, or is it a type of flower? What do you think a rhizome would be? So far, a rhizome is this. It might be a little hard to see. There we go. You guys see how those seagrass blades are connected together like that? The rhizome is like a root that connects a bunch of blades of seagrass together. They have their normal roots like any other plant. They also have the strand that will connect multiple blades of seagrass together. And the importance of that is that it connects them all together, which helps them grow more and more. 
it also helps them be more stable so that when you have those big waves and currents coming through your seagrass isn't just going to get ripped up very easily so they have more stability there in the water all right guys so go ahead and take out this worksheet here so i'm going to teach you about six types of seagrass i can find here in florida some of you on the east coast um, also will have a lot of these types of seagrass as well and in other places too so we're going to be talking about the six main types um, so how this works is I will explain to you guys the types. I'll show you a few pictures and it's up to you guys to identify them. Um, and we do have the answer key on our website so you guys can check to see if you did it correctly or not. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first one we're going to talk about is turtle grass. So turtle grass looks kind of like this. Turtle grass is going to be wider with flat blades of grass. And this is called turtle grass because it is a favorite of green sea turtle. So there's a species of sea turtles called the green sea turtle, and it loves to eat that turtle grass. It actually eats so much turtle grass that its inside muscle and meat turns green. So the green sea turtle isn't necessarily green on the outside, but its insides turns a little green because of all the sea grass it eats. That's pretty cool. Um, also, guys, if you know a flamingo, flamingos are pink because they eat shrimp. So that's another thing that kind of turns the color of its food. So the first one is turtle grass, and it's going to be those wider, flat blades of seagrass. The next one is called manatee grass. So manatee grass looks a little bit like this. It's thinner, and they look more like little tubes almost, and it's actually hollow on the inside. Now, I don't think I have to uh, really point it out, but manatee grass is called this because it's a favorite of the manatee. If you don't know what a manatee is, um, we'll look at a picture of it on our worksheet later, and we are going to do a lesson on manatees and sea turtles in the next few weeks. Um, but manatee grass is a favorite of the Florida manatee. It's hollow on the inside, looks more like tubes, so it's rounded at the top. All right, the next one we have is called shoal grass. So shoal grass looks a little bit like this. So shoal grass is thinner and looks more ribbon-like. So it's more ribbony looking and it's squared off and flat at the top. So shoal grass actually usually grows in like a cluster or a bush and they can actually handle warmer waters, rougher seas, and each blade has teeth like ridges on it. So it's a little bit pokey um, as well. All right, the next one we have is called Johnson's so Johnson's seagrass looks a little bit like this. They're kind of skinny and narrow, and then they come to a point at the top. So they are a smaller type of seagrass. It's actually an endangered species. Um, so an endangered species means that if we're not careful, it could go extinct and we won't have it anymore. You have star grass. Star grass looks very different. Um, so it's kind of easy to look at on your worksheet, but the star grass looks just like this. One cool thing about star grass is actually little pieces of it can get broken off and they can regrow in another area. Kind of like if anyone has ever tried to regrow a cactus or a succulent, you can take off a piece and regrow it. And finally, we have what we call paddle grass. So paddle grass is called this because it looks like little paddles. Um, so they do look similar to Johnson seagrass, except these ones are going to be smaller and wider. So that'll help you on the worksheet as well. They're going to be shorter and a little bit wider. Again, the paddle grass, the leaves are paddle shaped. And the paddle grass is good because it can actually handle different ranges of salinity or salt. So they can handle more fresh water, they can handle really, really salty areas. So they've got a bigger tolerance, which is awesome. So again, guys, um, go ahead and kind of work on this a little bit more. I'll do a little bit of a review for you guys. So again, the turtle grass is gonna be your wider flat blades of seagrass. It's the biggest seagrass that we have, followed by your manatee grass, which is going to be thinner, uh, is rounded at the top. Your shoal grass looks more like ribbons and is flat on the top. Your Johnson seagrass looks uh, kind of more like an oval and it points at the end. It's a little bit longer. 
Your star grass grows with a bunch of blades on it. And your paddle grass looks like a paddle. It's shorter and wider than your Johnson seagrass. Okay, guys, so I'm gonna go ahead and move on and talk about a few other things. So if you guys wanna keep working on that, you can. Set it aside and work on it later, that's up to you. So guys, seagrass has something that we call epiphytes. So go ahead and say epiphyte out loud. It's kind of a silly word. And epiphyte are smaller, microscopic, tiny, tiny pieces of algae. Um, sponges, little crustaceans, barnacles, two worms. An epiphyte is little living things that will live on these blades of seagrass. So I can actually show you a picture again. So if you see here on this shoal grass, you see all that hairy stuff growing on top of it. Those are all epiphytes, all small things that grow on top of the seagrass blades. So the amount of epiphytes covering um, the seagrass blades kind of changes depending on the water. So in a healthy seagrass bed, the epiphyte count on the seagrass is gonna be smaller, so you won't have as much. If the water is dirtier, maybe there's a little bit more pollution in the area, you'll have a lot more epiphytes growing on top of that seagrass. Um, so it's kind of cool that epiphytes are a little mini ecosystem within that seagrass ecosystem. So that's pretty cool. So guys, let me go ahead and post this question for you. You guys, why is seagrass important? So why do you think seagrass is important? Is it because it's a food source? Does it hold the sand and sediment down? Does it clean the water? Or is it a habitat? So why is seagrass important? What do you think? It's a food source. So like I just mentioned, sea turtles and manatees love to eat seagrass. It cleans the water. So the seagrass is responsible for cleaning up that water and making it nice and clear. Guys, you're not going to have a healthy coral reef ecosystem if you don't have healthy seagrass beds. So again, if your seagrass isn't doing well, you know your coral reefs aren't going to be doing well either. So you have to have healthy, nice seagrass in order to make sure that your other ecosystems are going to be okay. It also holds that sand and sediment down. So those rhizomes that we talked about, those rhizomes help keep all that sand down. That way, if a big wave comes, it doesn't blow over or wash over on top of the mangroves or the corals as well. And it's a habitat, it's that nursery. So a lot of baby animals, especially baby sharks, baby stingrays, baby fish, crabs, a lot of invertebrates, so things without a backbone, will hang out in the seagrass for protection. But guys, there are a lot of threats to our seagrass beds. So one of the big things, especially down here, um, is what we call a prop scar. So guys, a boat has a propeller on it. And a lot of times when people are out, are out boating, they don't really pay attention to where they are. And a lot of times these boats will go over really shallow water and then they'll actually destroy that seagrass and they'll create white lines in the seagrass beds. And it's very, very bad. So that is a big issue. And guys, those prop scars that can be created by boats will take 10 years or more to recover naturally. So it's a very, very damaging thing. You're destroying this habitat. It's a very big problem. Also pollution, uh, sewage, runoff. Um, down here especially, we have storm drains and every time it rains, everything on the road goes into the ocean. Dirty, dirty water is a big problem because even though seagrass can clean the water, you know, too much pollution, too much dirty stuff in the water isn't going to be good. It's going to make it harder for them and can get them sick and can kill the seagrass as well. We have algal blooms. So that's a big issue here. If you live um, somewhere in Florida, you probably know about red tide. That's a big issue for our seagrass beds. I'm sure where you guys are in other places, you have a body of water and you'll have these big algal blooms sometimes. This algae will take over the area and then it'll prevent the seagrass from being able to photosynthesize or get energy from the sun. A few other things are like dredging. So when you dig a part of the ocean to create maybe a canal or a bigger shipping channel, that is a big problem as well because you're destroying that seagrass and storms. So our storms are getting a lot much more stronger and it's damaging our seagrass, our mangroves and our corals. It's damaging all of them as well. So guys, there are a lot of issues that our seagrass are having to face, um, which is not good because seagrass is very, very, very important to us. So we wanna make sure that we protect it 
and easy ways to protect it is just making sure that you're doing your part. You're not polluting. You're picking up trash. You're not using a lot of chemicals, things like that. Even fertilizers for your yard is not going to be good for the environment. So a lot of things like that can help out. All right, guys. So let's go ahead and grab this uh, worksheet that we did with Miss Alex on Friday. So go ahead and pull that out and we're going to work on it together. If you don't have it, that's totally okay. You can go along with me and you'll be fine. So this is what it looks like. I went ahead and completed it. So I'm going to kind of talk to you guys about what I did. Um, so a lot of these animals, a lot of these organisms could actually go to multiple ecosystems. So if you are looking to grab that, if you want to cut out these animals, go ahead. Um, if you don't have the worksheet, just follow, follow along with me. Go ahead and point out what eco or what organism it is. So here you have an iguana. So that's the iguana there. You have the reef shark. You have the nurse shark down here. You have the sea star or the starfish. Uh, right here you have the lobster. All right. Here you have the juvenile baby fish. Here we've got a sea turtle. We'll go ahead and say this is a green sea turtle. You have the manatee here. You've got a dolphin here. This is an adult yellow snapper. This is a moray eel. So down here, moray eel. You've got a brain coral right here. You've got a southern stingray. You've got here a deer. Uh, for us down here, they are key deer. We have little, little deer. Um, so we're going to call this a key deer. It's going to be different from most of the deers that you guys know. All right. And up here, or down here, we have a, a barracuda. So that's a barracuda right there. All right, guys. So if you're still cutting out, that's totally fine. Let's go ahead and let's start with our coral reef. Or er, Let's go ahead, we'll start with the coral reef ecosystem that I made first. We'll do that. So for the coral reef ecosystem, I decided to put the dolphin because dolphins will come by the seagrass beds, but not as common as they are in the reef or in the more deeper water. So I put the dolphin in the deeper water. Here I put the reef shark, a Caribbean reef shark in the coral reef. It makes sense. Here I put the eel. So you again can find the eels in several different ecosystems. However, they do like the reefs the most because they can hide out in all of the little cracks and crevices and you know just kind of hide and look around. They love to be in little holes and rocks and hide through the coral. All right, here you have an adult yellowtail. So more adult fish will go hang out in the coral reef, especially. So the adult yellowtail, if you've ever swam in a coral reef, um, you'll definitely see these a lot. They're a type of snapper. In here, we put the brain coral in the coral reef. Now, guys, you can actually have coral in seagrass. You can have coral in mangroves. Um, but we're going to go ahead and put the brain coral in the coral reef for this one. But you can definitely have coral in all three ecosystems. All right, let's go ahead and do the mangrove ecosystem next. So the mangrove ecosystem... There was only really two that definitely had to be here. So the iguana and the key deer have to be in this ecosystem. The iguanas, they can swim, but they don't eat things that live in the seagrass or the coral, so that really wouldn't make sense for them. Um, and they don't want to swing, uh, swim long term. It's usually just to escape something. Uh, the deer as well, they can swim, but they don't eat anything in a seagrass ecosystem. They don't eat seagrass, they don't eat fish. They'll eat the mangrove leaves, um, especially down here. You will often see key deer uh, playing around in little mangrove trees. So they'll have the mangroves, but they, they won't go in the seagrass or the coral reefs. It's not very likely. I went ahead and I put that nurse shark in the mangrove ecosystem. Um, I decided to put it there just because I know that a lot of nurse sharks like to hang out in um, the mangrove roots. They can actually kind of stay they one spot, unlike many sharks that will have to move around more. They can hang out and just sleep. Um, I also was going to put the nurse shark in the seagrass bed, um, but I decided the mangroves. I put the lobster also in the mangrove, um, but you'll find the lobster in all three ecosystems as well. And then the barracuda. So barracudas can be in every single um, 
goes on this worksheet. Um, but I decided to put them here and to add a little fish to this ecosystem. And finally, here is the seagrass ecosystem. So the seagrass one, Miss Alex already put a pelican up here for you. So the pelican can really hang out in the seagrass ecosystem. They'll hang out in the mangrove and the coral reef as well. So the pelican can be in those ecosystems because pelicans eat fish. So if a pelican eats an organism in the seagrass, then it's part of that ecosystem. It's part of that food web or that food chain that we learned about last week. Um, manatees. So we already talked about a type of seagrass called manatee grass. Manatees can go in the mangroves. They actually have been found to munch on the mangrove leaves. Um, and you could occasionally see them in a coral reef, but most likely you're going to find the manatees in the seagrass beds. That's where their food is. Um, that's where they're going to want to be. They don't really want to be too, too shallow. So the mangroves wouldn't be a very good spot in case they need to escape, in case they're scared. They need to be able to swim off very quickly. I also added that green sea turtle to this because the green sea turtle munches on turtle grass. But again, you can find the uh, green sea turtles in the coral reef, um, but they're most likely going to be in seagrass. I also put the sea star in the seagrass. So the grass is home to a lot of invertebrates, so things without a backbone, that's a better place for them to be. You could see a sea star in the mangroves or the, or the coral reefs, um, but you're most likely going to see them in the seagrass. I also put that stingray in the seagrass bed. They're the one that could hang out in multiple ecosystems, so the mangroves or the corals, uh, but I decided to put it in the seagrass so that way I had more um, another predator in this ecosystem. And finally down here you have that baby fish. So we already talked about that seagrass is a nursery. So baby fish will hang out in the seagrass for protection. Um, you could also find baby fish hanging out in the mangroves. That's also a very good place to protect themselves. Um, but so I would say seagrass is probably a better place. So the baby fish definitely wants the seagrass ecosystem for this one. So again, guys, this is what my ecosystems look like. It's okay if yours is a little different, um, but there are a few things that I already pointed out that wouldn't be in different ones. For example, the iguana and the deer would not go into the other ecosystems. Um, the dolphin most likely would stay in the coral reef, and I would definitely probably keep the manatee in the seagrass ecosystem, and that baby fish should be neither the seagrass or the mangrove. All right, guys, so that ends my lesson with you all today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I hope you guys learned a little bit more about seagrass. Remember, you guys have those journal activities that 